Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa Continuing with <clears throat> chapter 6, I believe, of Stillness Flowing, the Heart of the Matter, Ajahn Chah's Teachings on Meditation, page 333. <clears throat> Not just sitting. Many Wat Papong monastics practiced walking meditation as much as or more than sitting meditation. The Buddha listed its benefits as producing a strong constitution good digestion, physical endurance, and a readiness to strive. Most importantly, he said that the samadhi arising during walking meditation is more easily sustained outside formal practice sessions than that developed while sitting, and Gujra Nikaya 5.29. Walking meditation provides both an alternative and a complement to sitting meditation. It is a good substitute for sitting meditation when physical ailments <clears throat> make sitting impractical or when hindrances that arise strongly during sitting are more manageable or absent while walking. Walking tends to be the best choice following a meal, for example, when mental dullness is likely to make sitting meditation difficult. Walking complements sitting by requiring cultivation of mindfulness in movement rather than stillness. Although the meditator walks with eyes downcast, the consciousness of forms and sounds, together with the rhythm of walking, prevents the meditator from becoming detached from the world of the senses in the same way that is possible during sitting meditation. As a result, it is often more difficult to pacify the mind while walking. But once the mind has become calm, the experience of varying sense data combined with the regular physical movements of the posture is conducive to, de to the development of wisdom. The thoughts that arise from the calmness become Dhamma Vichaya, the investigation of the Dhamma. In Thai forest monasteries like Wat Papong, every kuti has its own walking path, usually from 20 to 30 paces long. Lung Po recommended walking at a more or less normal pace in order to develop a habit of awareness easily integrated into daily life. Hands were to be clasped in front of the abdomen, never behind the back, a style more suited to that of a general inspecting the troops than a monk, Wompor said, <clears throat> and most definitely not hanging loosely by one's sides. In addition to being perceived to be unsightly, walking without clasping the hands together was considered too relaxed to promote inner restraint. Walking in such a way was too similar to leisurely strolling to be appropriate for meditation. Lungpur instructed that before beginning the session, meditators should stand and pay homage to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha in the manner they saw fit and clarify their intention for the following session. They should then begin to walk back and forth along the path, maintaining a constant mindfulness and alertness as they walked. One method by which this was to be achieved, Lungpur would advise, was through the use of the mantra Buddha, mentally reciting bud as the right foot touches the ground and do as the left foot touches. This was the basic means of stilling the mind. Maintain a continuous awareness on the object. If your mind becomes agitated or you get weary, then stop and still the mind. Ease it by focusing on the breath. When the mind has become sufficiently calm, then resume the walking meditation. Keep a constant alertness. Establish awareness at the beginning of the path. Be aware of it all. The beginning of the path, the middle of the path, the end of the path. Keep the awareness unbroken while you are walking. Sometimes a feeling of panic or fear may arise. Go against it. It's changeful. changeful. Courage arises, and that doesn't last either. It's all changeful. There's nothing to grasp onto. This gives rise to wisdom. Bringing forth wisdom doesn't refer to a knowledge based on memory. 
it means knowing the mind that thinks and perceives. All thoughts and perceptions arise in our minds. This is, this is, I'm in the middle of a quote from Ajahn Shah, I realized. Good or bad, right or wrong, just acknowledge their presence. Don't give them any undue significance. Suffering is just suffering. Happiness is just happiness. It's all a fraud. Hold your ground. Don't go chasing after them. Don't chase after happiness and don't chase after suffering. Know them. Know them and then put them down. Wisdom will arise. Keep going against the stream of the mind. When you feel sufficiently tired, then stop and come off the, of the walking path. But be careful to maintain the continuity of mindfulness. Standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, maintain a constant awareness. Whether you're walking to the village on alms round, walking through the village receiving food, eating the food, or whatever, be mindful at all these times in every posture. Lungpur recommended that meditators not follow their first thought to end a walking meditation session. He said that after deciding to leave their walking path, they should continue to walking for at least a few more minutes. Sometimes the feeling that it was time to change posture would pass away by itself, and the meditation could be extended. If not, and it was indeed a good time to stop, then a wise habit of not reacting immediately to the impulses of a mind that might well be tainted by defilement had been strengthened. Lungpur taught that effort had to be sustained from the first moment of consciousness in the early morning until the last moment before sleep in every posture. Quote, when you lie down, then lie on your right side with the left foot resting on the right. Concentrate on buddho, buddho, until you fall asleep. This is what is called lying down with mindfulness. On one occasion, he maintained that an adept practitioner could remember whether he fell asleep on the inhalation or exhalation. Whether meditating while walking, sitting, standing, or lying down, the daily practice was to reestablish balance as soon as it was lost. Allowing meditation, meditators were to be patient and persevering. Allowing the mind to become discouraged or irritated when it refused to stay on its object would only compound the problem. Taming the mind was like taming a wild animal. If you didn't give up, then sooner or later the animal was sure to. In another of his favorite animal similes, he compared the practice to herding a water buffalo. Quote, your mind is like a water buffalo. Mental states are like rice plants. The knowing is like the owner. What do you do when you graze a buffalo? You let it go its way, but you keep an eye on it. If it goes close to the rice plants, then you yell at it. When the buffalo hears you, it moves away. But you can't afford to let your attention wander. If it's stubborn and won't obey you, then you have to get a stick and give it a thrashing. Part two, thorns and prickles. This section is on the hindrances. The immediate obstacles to the development of samadhi and wisdom are a group of defilements that the Buddha called the nirvarana, or hindrances. He described them as, other, as overgrowths of the mind that stultify insight. They are five in number. One, kamachanda, sensual thoughts. Two, vayapada, ill will. Three, tinamida, sloth and torpor. Four, uducha kakucha, agitation, guilt, remorse. Wichi kicha, number five, wichi kicha, doubt and indecision. The Buddha made clear the vital importance of dealing with the hindrances as follows. Without, without having overcome these five, it is impossible for a monk whose insight thus lacks strength and power to know his own true wheel, the wheel of others and the wheel of both, or that he will be capable of realizing that superior human state of, dis of distinctive achievement, a truly noble distinction in knowledge and vision. And Gudra Nikaya 5.51. Elsewhere, the Buddha compared the hindrances to the baser metals impairing the purity of gold. Once the gold has been freed of impurities, then it becomes pliant and wieldy and can be wrought into whatever ornament one wishes. Similarly, the mind freed of the five hindrances will be pliant and wieldy, will have radiant lucidity and firmness, 
and will concentrate well on the eradication of the taints. To whatever state realizable by the higher mental faculties one may direct the mind, one will, in each case, acquire the capacity of realization if the other conditions are fulfilled. And Gudra Nikaya 5.23. The basic method for dealing with hindrances is to cultivate a mindful, balanced effort combined with positive regard for the meditation object to the extent that as yet unarisen hindrances do not arise in the first place. When that is not possible, and having become aware that they are caught in a hindrance, meditators are taught to abandon it without regret and patiently return to the meditation object. Rather than immediately reestablishing attention on the breath, Lumpur taught that at the moment of recognizing the hindrance for what it was and letting it go, meditators should also acknowledge the distraction as maine, changeful, impermanent, unstable. By doing so, they introduced an element of wisdom into meditation that would gradually flourish as their meditation skills grow, grew. Quote, when something arises in your mind, no matter if it's something you like or something you dislike, something you think is right or something you think is wrong, cut it right off by reminding yourself it's changeful. It doesn't matter what it is, just chop right through it. Changeful, changeful. Use this single axe to chop through mental states. Everything is subject to change. Where can you find anything real and solid? If you see this instability, then the value of everything decreases. Mental states are all worthless. Why would you want things of no value? For those struggling with the hindrances and feeling discouraged at their lack of success, he gave the following encouragement. Quote, Even if your mind finds no peace, merely sitting cross-legged and putting forth effort is already a fine thing. This is the truth. You could compare it to being hungry and having nothing to eat except plain rice. You've got nothing to eat with the rice, and you feel upset. What I'm saying is, it's good that you've got rice to eat. Plain rice is better than nothing at all, isn't it? If plain rice is all you've got, then eat it up. Practice is the same. Even if you experience only a very small amount of calm, it's still a good thing. If the simple expedient of patiently returning to the object again and again was not working, then specific antidotes needed to be employed. There was much to be learned in the quest to transcend the hindrances. Longpore advised looking on them as teachers or tests of wisdom rather than enemies. Next section on sensual desire. The first hindrance occurs through indulgence in thoughts bound up with the sensual world. The meditator who is still unable to find satisfaction in meditation tends to seek pleasure, warmth, and distraction by turning to the world of the senses. This hindrance's most powerful expression lies in sexual desire and fantasies, but it also includes taking pleasure in memories or imagination relating to any other aspect of the sensual world that the meditator finds attractive. Food, music, movies, sports, politics, any topic at all that is felt to be enjoyable by the one who dwells upon it. In dealing with this hindrance, Lungpur emphasized the protection of sense restraint. Eating little, sleeping little, talking little were made key principles for the Sangha at Wat Papong. The mind was to be taught to avoid becoming engrossed in the general appearance or particular features of any sense object. It was not possible to simply turn off a habit of indulgence and sensual pleasures for the duration of a meditation session. There also had to be a constant effort to govern such desires in daily life. As the key condition for this hindrance is dwelling unwisely on the attractive aspects of sensual experience, the specific antidote lies in replacing it with wise reflection on the unattractive aspects. Sexual desire being the most potent and disruptive expression of the hindrance, it is the one to which most specific remedies are applied. Quote, Visualize the body as a corpse in the process of decay, or think of all of the parts of the body, such as lungs, spleen, fat, feces, and so forth. Remember, the, remember these and visualize this loathsome aspect of the body when lust arises. This will free you from lust. If you look at the human body and you like what you see, then ask yourself why. Investigate it. Look at head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, and skin. The Buddha taught us to hammer in the Buddha taught us to hammer in the reflection on these things. Distingu distinguish them one by one, separate them from the body. 
Visualize setting fire to them or peeling off the skin. Do that until you become fluent. Contemplation of the body has already been referred to as a meditation object in its own right and as a preliminary exercise preceding mindfulness of breathing. Here it is employed as a means of hauling the mind back onto the middle path when it has strayed into the realm of the senses. Once this hindrance has been abandoned, meditators may then, then resume their focus on their original meditation object. The next section is on ill will. Ill will is conditioned by ungratified desire. Its occurrence in meditation is often based on an obsession with things or people that are not doing, saying, or being the way we would prefer. The mind picks up a rankling perception or memory and broods on it. In Jack Cornfield's Notes from a Session of Questions and Answers, Lumpur is asked for advice in dealing with this hindrance. The, how about anger? What should I do when I feel anger arising? <coughs> you must use loving kindness. When angry states of mind arise in meditation, balance them by developing feelings of loving kindness. If someone does something bad or gets angry, don't get angry yourself. If you do, you are being more ignorant than they are. Be wise. Keep compassion in mind, for that person is suffering. Fill your mind with loving kindness as if he were a dear brother. Contemplate on the feeling of loving kindness as a meditation object. Spread it to all beings in the world. Only through loving kindness is hatred overcome. Sometimes you may see other monks behaving badly. You may get annoyed. This is suffering unnecessarily. It is not yet our, it is not yet our dhamma. You may think like this. He is not as strict as I am. They are not serious meditators like us. Those monks are not good monks. This is a great defilement on your part. Do not make comparisons. Do not discriminate. Let go of your opinions and watch the mind. This is our dhamma. You can't possibly make everyone act as you wish to or be as you wish or to be like you. This wish will only make you suffer. It is a common mistake for meditators to make but watching other people won't develop wisdom. Simply examine yourself, your feelings. This is how you will understand. Although it makes sense for meditators to seek the most supportive environment for practicing meditation, there is almost always something or other that the mind, if it wishes, can latch onto with aversion. When meditators complained about external conditions disturbing them, Lumpur would reply that the problem did not lie in the condition. Conditions were just doing what conditions have always done and always will do, arise and pass away. The problem arose, he said, because the meditator was disturbing the condition. In other words, it was the meditator's aversion to the condition, rather than the condition itself, that was the true hindrance to meditation. Often the hindrance of ill will occurs as a, as a dissatisfaction or frustration with the meditator's practice. Meditators can become aggravated by their inability to progress as fast as they hoped, angry at the particular problems that arise, resentful of physical pain that makes it hard to focus. They dwell on the things they don't like again and again until a deep furrow is dug into which their mind throws itself repeatedly. Meditation itself can become an object of aversion. A frightening experience or strong painful feelings while sitting may make the mind resist continuing the practice. At this stage, meditators look to fill their time with every possible activity except meditation. When affected by this hindrance, Lung Por encouraged his disciples to keep returning to the basic principles enshrined in the Four Noble Truths. Suffering arises through craving. In this case, the root of the problem lies in the desire not to have, not to be, not to, experience, not to have to experience, the I don't need this mind. Quote, your mind is chaotic because of craving. You don't want to think. You don't want to have anything going on in your mind. This not wanting is the craving called vibhavatanha. The more you desire not to think, the more you encourage thoughts. You don't want the mind to think, so why do the thoughts come? You don't want it to be that way, so why is it? Exactly. It's because you don't understand your mind that you want it to be a certain way. While Lungpur emphasized this understanding of craving as an antidote to this hindrance, 
The suttas recommend meditation on loving kindness. By its systematic development, thoughts of kindness and benevolence are able to replace thoughts of anger and resentment. Interestingly, this meditation was not one that Lung Por greatly encouraged for monastics. He considered it to be a risky practice for a celibate monk or nun, as the pure emotion of loving kindness could easily morph into more sensual feelings. Also, monastics who practiced loving kindness meditation diligently often became very attractive to the opposite sex, which could also jeopardize their monastic occasion, voca their monastic vocation. Okay. Stop there. My, my perception is that was the, you know, that was the 1970s it, Ajahn Chah was the beaming metta. His, his, early, his early disciples didn't see that so much, I don't think. When he was, he may have, he may have switched to metta when he was very confident in his own, in his own practice that nothing was going, nothing would shake him. So he could, so he could attract all the people he wanted to and he would just stay right there. What are you basing that on? Oh, girl, yeah. What am I? The the earlier, w sorry, the Lumpur Chas manifested metta more in the nineteen seventies, or no? I guess just like where where he was coming from, why he yeah, did. Let's see. Okay. You mean that particular making that particular rationale? Yeah. I haven't I haven't read that in I haven't read that in particular. That was just. Um, I mean, I have heard people commenting that, you know, on the different, the different characters that Lumpur Shah would manifest, whether some would say, some would say he manifested more metta towards Westerners, some would say that he manifested more, we in, more metta only in his later years. I know he was perceived as extraordinarily fierce when he was in the, uh, 50s and early 60s at Wat Papong. But no, I'm just, I haven't, I, I can't recall anything where Lumpur Shah actually described his reason for cultivating uh, metta. I don't uh, remember anything about the timing of Lumpur Shah's having metta or not having metta, but I do remember Lumpur Liam saying that, uh, that Lumpur Shah chose metta and he himself chose equanimity. And certainly the stories of the style with which he ran the monastery in the early years was much more, <coughs> you know, <coughs> fierce uh, and, and directed with uh, austerity practices and, and uh, what you might want to call the harsh training but, and that that eased up you know, when, as years went by. But that also doesn't preclude, in my mind, having meta. meta yeah, that's not so. Like, it meta. was what he yeah. considered the most meta possible for, <clears throat> for training people. And there's also this, there's like a story of how people were drawn to him, yeah. even in those early years, even in the early years. He had this kind of quality meta magnet. Yeah. Like, One uh, thing that was well, like like the story I'm thinking of is like really early on. There was the village drunk. Mm -hmm. He would go to sleep under a little child's cootie. It's the only place he could sleep. Right. One thing that seems very clear to me is the distinction between the sort of Ajahn Shah that he presented to his Thai disciples and the Ajahn Shah he presented to his Western disciples. Mm -hmm. That's just an impression that I, that I get very clearly. Mm -hmm. That, And I met, my guess is that, hypothesizing perhaps in the early days of the Westerners, he tried that same hardcore <clears throat> sort of approach and style that makes sense with, with your average Thai person. 
just been quite generally who have so much, especially the Nissan, so much metta, generosity, laid backness, that you have to balance that out with like a Ajahn Mun type, Ajahn Mahabua type, fierce Ajahn Shah type, where you have these neurotic Westerners coming by. Also, a lot of like war veterans. It just makes complete sense to me. Mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. But that's surprising. I mean, I guess I had never heard of Ajahn Chah not prescribing loving kindness for Westerners. But uh, so that was interesting. I guess that might not have been in the first iteration of the book. Yeah, that's quite striking, actually. No. I don't know if it ever said that in what Padre Kachan just read, but he did say he didn't prescribe metta for monks. Yeah, for not monks. just Western. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess Western monks is what I was speaking about, like mm -hmm. his, his early Western disciples. Mm -hmm. I think it is a good point, though, because it's like I was talking with somebody about <clears throat> any other practice that's like a super practice can lead to negativity if it's picked up in the wrong way. <clears throat> and metta practice, you know, the same thing, you know, it's sort of like if you use it and choose the wrong object for metta practice, then it can increase sensuality if you're, you know, using something that you're extremely attracted to. <laughs> and without being metta, mm -hmm. you know, getting into a little bit uh, dicey territory there. So I guess just thinking my own experience with Western monks. Like somebody giving the advice, you know, don't don't practice metta because, you know, when you I don't know, it just that just sounds like really really dangerous. Just my own experience with, with living with Westerners and being a Westerner. Well, certainly it's not said by Nupur Pasama teacher. Yeah. Yeah. After after I did my first year of uh, a super practice, which he suggested for the first year, he suggested for me to do an entire year of metta practice so, <laughs> to balance it. So. I think that is often important for, as you say, for Westerners. We obviously have to have metta for each other and so on, but it's like you have to know, yeah, don't have metta for someone you're attracted to. Or, I mean, metta, I like the translation of goodwill rather than loving kindness. Yeah. It's goodwill is just like be nice to each other or be kind. Um, not to, not, not cultivating metta doesn't mean be angry at each other, be irritated with each other. But I've found That's like often not practicing metta or the impression of other people not practicing metta does translate to being angry with yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. No, and in that sense I would think it's incredibly important to have metta yeah. for the people you're living with. But uh, yeah, I have school. had the experience of having, um, say, uh, seeing someone suffering and having genuine goodwill for them, but then that, uh, you know, then they start coming around more, say someone of the opposite sex, or, you know, it's like, it doesn't start as attraction in the beginning. You might have genuine goodwill, but then they, then it grows from there. So that's what Mungur Shah, I think, is saying to be very careful of. I'd be curious if anyone has, or the audience, um, techniques for metta because like with metta usually I'll have a technique which works for like a week or two and then it's like nope <laughs> it just fizzles and like and along poor pasana like that great advice on like shrinking the people and bringing them into your heart that helped a lot mm -hmm. for a while and um, one of the interesting backdoors I found was like after doing a suba for a while in a meditation session suddenly I actually can't access the metta again somehow but um but I'd be curious about other people. You can like, or you cannot? I can, like, and I'll come to the end of my metta, and then if I do a super for a while, suddenly the metta is available again. But I'm curious if other people have been, like visualizations which work for them or skillful means, because I have like a roster, a rotating thing, but, it, but a lot of times just none of them really hit after a while of doing them, so I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, it's like with any kind of, any, this is just my experience, you know, with any kind of, um, Object of meditation, it, uh, like anything in the conditioned realm, it, it, you know, the mind gets used to it or it gets inured to it, and you have to kind of constantly be creative. Um, what with method meditation, particularly for myself, I find that you know the object that 
I sometimes you know will attend to 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 initialize the the experience will vary and we just you know whoever it is or whatever it is you know one thing works one thing doesn't work if it doesn't work try something else but that as soon as I mean the idea of at least in, again in my experience is, is to find some object that engenders that um, affect of quality um, that you actually feel in the body in the heart. Uh, as some sort of you know experience of like warmth or gentleness or peace or you know that there's got to be some sort of affect. I mean, metta is a it's you know it's kind of like a, as Lumpur uh, Sumedha would say it's a mature emotion, but it is like a, it's an emotional state. It's a uh, you know it's a, and that's what I can think of as affect, and it's not a thought or a concept. You know, it's a state of mind. Um, so that as soon as that feeling, that feeling tone, uh, that experience arises, to turn towards that. Um, and then sometimes I find it's useful to give it a handle, you know, a, a phrase, a, a one word description that describes that particular feeling. And oftentimes when I need a bit of softening, I just bring up that descriptor word like gentle. And it evokes the same feeling without having to go through this whole thinking of an image of somebody or making a recitation of a few phrases, you know, like, may I be happy, may I be well, um, and then just having that handle with a word that describes the actual experience, peace, gentle, kind of warm, whatever it is, that brings it up very quickly for myself. But then, you know, the mind gets fickle and sometimes that doesn't work and you just have to, okay, go back to this or think of that one person who, who you know, was very kind to you. Uh, sometimes that's easy, a, a nice image. It's rather than thinking of a time when, or somebody that you should produce kindness for or um, produce uh, goodwill towards, thinking of a time when somebody displayed that to yourself. Uh, somebody offered you a sense of, goodness that you really appreciated, you know, to bring that up as a recipient. There's just all sorts of ways to keep it going. At no, Ajahn Jai Saro recommended sometimes spreading that to all the kittens and then all the puppies and just like having fun of it that way or another one I've heard was visualizing holding the hand of someone when they're um, three years old and then holding their hand on their deathbed. Mm -hmm. Those have found very effective too. But, but then attaching a label to it, that's really helpful. Thank you. The actual experience of it. I've also found that probably the biggest hindrance to um, like metta practice in general would be not having metta for oneself. Mm -hmm. I found that it's, gosh, it's like so hard. It's like oh, difficult for me to describe you know, how, like, how difficult, I don't know, how, like, how little kindness I have, have had for myself, but also how difficult it's been for me to see how little kindness I've had for myself. And so, I think the first instinct in a lot of the classical instruction and classical kind of techniques have always been to radiate out or think of other people or to bring other people into your heart and all these things. And um, I found that it does take quite a bit of effort and quite a I don't know, it fiddles out and so forth, but rather really, 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 really focusing on having that done for myself, my own experience, my own, my own emotional states, all these things, um, then being kind to others is effortless mm -hmm. when I'm in that state. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, it's like sort of keeping, you know, it's like when kind of discontent and resentment and a feeling of inadequacy, it's like the air I breathe. And so it, it's, it's, it's incredibly, um, I guess, difficult to even realize that I need to do metta for myself. Mm -hmm. But once I have these sort of, with the breath of fresh air, like I actually feel, like I think of a lot of in terms of self-respect, mm -hmm. like having actual self-esteem and self-respect. When, when, I can, when I feel that and that warmth, but it's the warmth sort of deep and it's directed 
to myself and my own experience, then um, it lasts longer and it's, it's uh, yeah, it's easier than, it's, I mean, it's, like I said, almost effortless to have it radiate out towards others, mm -hmm. both, you know, in body and speech, but also, you know, in the thinking about other people and, of course, you know, compassion and what you got and everything, so, yeah, I know it's, it's kind of cliche, you should do mental to yourself first, but it's like, I can't, I don't know if I can emphasize it enough how, how difficult that has been and how important that has been for my own mental practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because with, with seeing the, the painfulness of that kind of self-judgment, self-criticism, just not wanting to do that anymore. <laughs> I can really understand that it's a painful experience to keep doing that. I think that's why it's said too that real metta is, it's said that that's Metta and Upeka are the two most difficult of the ten Barnabies to cultivate. If we're to really have it. Just kind of a, another thought that occurs to me too is this is like the whole aspect of radiating, like sending Metta out to people. You know, it's sort of like. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes the times that I found feel the most aversion is when somebody's trying to say, <laughs> you would be happy, you would be happy, you know, it's like, oh, I'm feeling kind of sad. Well, no, you should be happy. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I even reflect on this in the, in the you know, the basic uh, I will abide pervading chant that we do. And it's sort of like, to me, it's like you expand the mind first. You know, you, you, you have the quality, say, of metta in your own heart. Um, and rather than sending out the metta, you just kind of expand your sphere of, of awareness to include within that same central sphere other people. So it's like you're not pushing the metta out to somebody, but you're just widening your own sphere of, of consciousness um, with that meta to include and to include more space, to include more people. So it's sort of like I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind. I will just like ex gradually expand my pervasion of my own mind. And then it happens to be imbued with loving kindness, you know, rather than actually pushing it outside of my sphere into somebody else's sphere. And that to me is where you get the boundless quality. Whatever the mind is imbued with, whether it's kindness or compassion or equanimity or whatever. But that the expansion is just within your own sense of conscious awareness. So that in a sense you're bringing people into that sphere gradually and more and more and more, and more to include all beings. When I, when I think of the people that I've met, experienced in my life who have, quote, radiated or sort of been very, very well developed in the Brahma Viharas, it's never felt like they didn't push it. It's pushing or impinging or anything or like, man, there's none of that. There's the exact opposite of that sense of neediness yeah. or that sense of projection that oftentimes can come from that sort of the radiation. And I, I, I've come to sort of understand it or whatever, that, that sense of when people try to push it out or, or, or radiate it out, it's, it's actually because of the feeling of emptiness or feeling of neediness mm -hmm. and then wanting to, you know, basically fulfill themselves by sort of, you know, pushing out on other people or projecting on other people. Whereas it's the exact opposite, when your mind is so balanced mm -hmm. and full that you don't need anything from anybody, mm -hmm. you can receive them and you can, you can sort of, that awareness of that mind can just completely envelop and receive everything that that person is experiencing, um, whether or not it's sadness or happiness or whatever. And that's, yeah, I appreciate your... Very, very expansive, receptive kind of state. Mm -hmm. 